Good evening, everybody. Um, I think that we are ready to go. We still have some people enjoying your dinner, but that's okay. We can we can multitask. So um, this is a joint meeting of the Longmont City Council and the Boulder County Commissioners for September 29th, 2022. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, we have a really full agenda. I'm assuming everybody in here, we know everybody, but let's go through a fast uh, introduction. I'll start with the uh, with commissioners um, and we'll work our way around. So, Barb, do you want to start out and let us know who you are? Thank you, yes. I'm not a commissioner, but my name is Barb Held and I'm county staff. Thank you. Is this a microphone? It is. Thank you. Just Thank you. Turn it on. Turn it on. Yeah. Anyway, my name is Matt Jones. I'm a public commissioner. It's great to see everybody. I like these to get together. We don't do it enough. We break. We go talk to you together and see what's up. Thanks. Great. District, so I'm just proud to be here in Longmont with y'all this evening. And I do hope that we can do quick names and introductions, but I can, and then I'll move us into what we are going to do. So I just want to, um, to thank you for hosting us and uh, for this great meeting again this year. I'm Janet Peterson, I'm the Boulder County Administrator, and um, Commissioner Claire Levy um, gives her excuses she's not able to be with us this evening, but uh, wishes you all well and wishes she could be here. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Clay Fong, and I'm the Chief of Staff of Boulder County Commissioners, having started uh, last spring. So good to meet everybody. Thank you. Um, this this mic is there's a lot of feedback associated with this mic, and it goes on. Tim Waters, I represent Ward One, uh, City Council. Marsha Martin, Ward Two. Aaron Rodriguez, I'm an at-large council member. Joan Peck, Mayor. <laughs> Susie Longo Ferry, Board 3 Rep. Shakita Yabra at large. Carol Dominguez, City Manager. And Eugene May, City Attorney. Do we want staff in the back to introduce themselves? None of us have Mike Don Quintana, City Clerk. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Zach Arden, Public Safety Chief for the City of Longmont. Christina Pacheco, Children, Youth, and Families Division Manager. Carmen Rodriguez, Community and Neighborhood Resources. And uh, Igor Mendoza, Community Services. Thank you. So, as I said, we have a pretty packed agenda. There are six items on it. Uh, well, hopefully, we'll get through this, but if not, if anyone has on um, council or commissioners have anything else that they would like to discuss tonight, we hopefully will have time for that. I'm going to turn the meeting now over to Commissioner Rochini. Um, and she will run on me for us. Got a yellow light now. What is that? It's off. Red versus yellow. It, it's on. It's on now. Okay. Now it's a red light instead of green light. I'm ready. Thank you, everybody. So let's take a look. Two things. What I'd like us to do. I'm gonna give y'all a minute to help me do this. Because we have people in the back, and we have people I understand live, so I'm not gonna just talk to you all right in front of me. And I have people behind me. Let me follow or to use this. Just press, press the button. Thank you, appreciate that. So we have put together, uh, and for folks who may not know, we do meetings, the county commissioners do meetings with our commissioners from around the region, from our towns and cities, and we try to keep it on an annual uh, schedule. And we also have experienced COVID as the rest of the world has, and so this has been great to um, get this going again uh, last year, as far as meetings and opportunities to get to know each other to hear about priorities and to listen to the work that folks are doing. What I would like to do to start us off is to give our 
council members and the mayor an opportunity as well as uh, us as commissioners an opportunity to just give a quick addition of your introduction but what work that you're focused on i think it's really helpful for all of us to know where are you so if i have a question about a project or something i hear on the news then i know which council person to go to and vice versa and i think it's very helpful for the public and transparency and understanding how we work in local government to have a better idea of what it is that we're all working on and doing so i am happy to turn it over to commissioner jones so that he can briefly just talk about the work that he's doing in the commissioner's office well i'm trying to pass ballot measures is what i'm trying to do uh, really that's my focus right now the three ballot measures we have on it. and i uh, continue to work on environmental issues it's kind of my passion every time i see eugene may i think oil and gas thank you Jake, for all the work you did to help the cause that resulted in the senate bill okay, it's complete my head let's do it again <laughs> Um, so that's my work. I want to get to the agenda, so we can do that. Great, thank you. Uh, just really quickly, outside of all of the day-to-day uh, -day work that we're doing and the land use hearings that we're running uh, to and from around Lower County, as you all know, um, a couple of the projects that I'm working on separately is Workforce Lower County and that board, um, and we are in the month right now of celebrating the future of work and what those opportunities look like for our residents around the county. I have been working on the executive advisory board at the Florida County Fairgrounds, and some of you probably know that we're in concept three. It was a significant amount of work, especially during COVID, in regards to community outreach and hearing about what, what we would like to see the Florida County Fairgrounds look like as a structure, infrastructure opportunities for new collaboration and more users. So that's been a great uh, process, and there's some staff who's been helping on that. Um, in regards to transportation, Commissioner Levy is, is a point person with Dr. Cog, um, and I was working on Highway 119, that particular corridor last year, and we continue to work on Highway 287, um, both our south, but also in the future looking at the north. And what does that look like for connectivity with the bikes and other, other routes and opportunities? The other one that I think is really relevant to this evening's conversation is I continue to lead the consortium of cities. And for those of you who have been um, on the council and also involved in work that happens around the county, a lot of those initial conversations begin at the Consortium of Cities with different representatives from all of the councils and, and from our town and cities, for towns and cities, the commissioner's office, and also Brookfield. And we are now <coughs> in a meeting last week in regards to the rural wage. Uh, the regional housing partnership started at that, that group and some of our other work. So, um, those are just a couple of the pieces. I'd love to turn it over to maybe we'll go from this side, Council Councilmember Waters, and, and then head down that way if you'd like to share any specific projects that you're working on. Thanks. <clears throat> push it to push button. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Lodgemi uh, and Commissioner Jones and, and county staff. Um, <clears throat> you know, we, our work doesn't kind of lay out quite the way yours does with the areas of responsibility. Uh, that we have a chance to pursue uh, both from policy and operations. Uh, but in terms of topics that I have particular interest in where I spend time when I'm not involved on a Tuesday night would be with primarily with our early childhood work and, and I'm, I'm anxious to follow up on, on that topic tonight in this in this meeting. And we're all involved in housing discussions and in what to do about housing, et cetera, things that you see on this agenda. So uh, I'll pass the mic, but that's my you know, top, top of mind for me is what we do or not do for our youngest residents. Hi, I'm Marsha Martin. Um, my focus is because I don't think it's really possible to tease these three topic areas apart um, are the clean energy transition, um, new urbanism and urban electrification, and density. And then um, transit, because if you don't focus on multimodal transit in a better way than we're doing now, you can't eliminate the greenhouse gases and you can't squish the people together to put more of them in the same space. So um, really all of those are so closely related that I find it difficult to um, 
think about one without focusing on all of them. Thanks. Um, hello. Based on my background, a lot of kind of my work and conversations uh, stem around housing. I was a former planning zoning commissioner for the city of Longwood, and I'm a real estate appraiser by profession. So uh, I spent a lot of time with our planning and zoning commission as well as uh, uh, talking to our, our fellow council members about our visions as far as what it looks like as far as uh, affordable and attainable housing. So that's kind of you know, my special interest as it goes. Hello, um, I am. I work on everything on this agenda, just as I think all council does. But specifically, I am working on unhoused residents, um, and uh, that's a lot of work. We're, ho we're hopefully going to move that needle in the near future. Uh, also, um, regional and intra-city transportation. We've been having a lot of meetings about it. I work uh, on Dr. Cog with Commissioner Levy. Uh, we have a lot of <coughs> greenhouse gas goals and targets that we need to meet, so there's a lot of discussion about how do we do that, and if we can do it on a, a county level as well, it would be really helpful if we can collaborate. Um, so I, Susie Lomba Ferry, uh, council member four and three. Um, so <coughs> some of the things that, you know, I look at priorities and things that, that I've been focusing on as well as, and it seems it's in line with a lot of what other council members are doing as well, um, but looking at housing for workforce housing. Folks, working class people who don't make enough to qualify, you know, to hit that market rate, but make too much to qualify for affordable housing. So looking at those options for our teachers, our firefighters, our police officers, all, you know, all of our public sector employees who are kind of you know, squeeze out of home ownership. So looking at that piece, as well as early childhood education, I'm a third grade bilingual teacher, so by date. <laughs> and, um, and so looking at those opportunities for education early on, as well as daycare for working class people. Um, I teach in a um, bilingual school. We have, um, you know, the high 90s uh, free reduced lunch. A lot of our parents have multiple jobs and having those opportunities for them to be able to continue work and have a safe place for their for their children. Um, mental health is a passion of mine and working with um, staff and other entities around um, <coughs> quality mental health access for all our residents. Um, and that, that's something that is, is very personal to me from a um, family standpoint. Um, and then a youth engagement. So getting our youth involved. One of the projects I did with growing up older with my class was the redesign of the sugar sugar beet um, factory. So they got to, to envision what they wanted to see in that. So <coughs> finding opportunities to tie the school district into what we're doing at the local level. Um, and zero waste, a member of RCAP, um, we're, we're focusing on that as well. Shakia Yafro. Um, everything that's on this agenda, specifically, um, I believe we're all working on. I don't think we're probably working on opioids, but that is a concern. So for me, our youth engagement as well, as far as um, our young adult youth, meaning hoping that we can have them a part of the city and also moving them into um, internships within the city, providing them op more opportunities and hoping that if they go off to college, they'll come back to Longmont and hoping that they will also feel like they are a part of the city and we have provided them the tools and skills to go out into the real world. Um, also, I would say housing for sure, affordable housing and workforce, but for me, mostly those who are renting and feel like they can never, ever, ever be able to own a home in Colorado. Creating a program or um, researching for programs that renters can have uh, an opportunity to purchase a home, although it may take them five years, but they know in that fifth year, they'll be able to purchase them a home with programming and hopefully escrow accounts with their rent with their landlords. And so if we can create a program with landlords and renters 
um, that would be awesome. Then people would have hope and be able to generate wealth. Thank you all, appreciate that um, from the introductions. Just looking at the agenda, there's a few topics that have already been uh, discussed and put on this agenda, but I wanna make sure that there's something else people want us to add now. And we're gonna try really hard to get to everything that we can. Just keeping in mind that last year, we had a long list and we didn't quite get through it, but I just wanna open that up if there's any other items that folks will wanna add to this agenda. Councilor Rogers. Martha, thanks for the <clears throat> question. Would you would you entertain some feedback just in the process of developing the agenda? I don't I don't want to get this off to a negative start. I don't either. But um, the process of building the agenda has been has been disappointing to me. Okay. And if if you'd like to know why, I'd like to share that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we were asked for agenda items uh, from our clerk. And what's on the list, I submitted five agenda items. Three of the items I submitted are on this list. I think I'm the only council member who submitted an agenda item. So um, the two of the items I submitted, whoever processes the agenda that decided shouldn't go on, and I think that's fine, that's, it's your meeting. But the, but the others that I submitted were edited. And what is troubling to me is to be asked for agenda items to submit them and I, it wasn't it wasn't kind of random thoughts or it wasn't thoughtless what i the way i wanted the agenda items that i submitted for someone to edit them and publish the agenda without any conferring with who submitted this and we're going to change this and the reason i'm concerned about it is i read a piece in the Longmont leader yesterday uh, that was reporting on one of the agenda items one of the items on this agenda and it was a total misinterpretation of what the intent of the agenda item is, and I think because of the way it was worded. So, you know, to the degree that anybody on in the county is concerned about not offending other elected officials when asked to submit an agenda item, somebody might want to close the loop if you're going to change what's submitted and let somebody know that it was changed and why. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, and I'm happy to respond just from the standpoint of. Uh, as we do with all the meetings that we, public meetings that we participate with, towns and cities and other commissions from around the region, we start with, here's some suggestions and someone else sends some suggestions. So I don't know where the, the disconnect of, I submitted something very specific and it came back to something different. I will tell you that I edited um, because I hadn't received uh, other uh, ideas either. And what I was, my intent on that was to make sure that all of us could speak to a more general topic versus a very pinpoint specific. Um, but I didn't know that they were your ideas. I didn't know whose ideas they were, and I didn't go back to council member, but instead um, allowed my staff who are super professionals and yours too, um, and I can say that because I worked for the city of Longmont as well. Um, so what I'm hearing is that we need to have a it's a process. Potential process. Yeah, I just, yeah. I just think at, at this level, if asked, you know, it's going to be changed. Somebody deserves the courtesy of being told, "Hey, we're modifying what you submitted for these reasons. It's more understandable. You know, it's more <coughs> generic. It's more engaging, or whatever." It's it, that was the disappointment. I said, "Well, who edited my work without talk, without talking to me about it?" Yeah. That, that as an adult, that's never happened. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that feedback, and we'll we'll talk about how, as a process piece, we can make sure everybody understands what that process is. Any other feedback about how we got to our agenda, or just additions to the agenda, so we can keep moving forward? Yes. Thank you, Marjorie, for asking that. <coughs> These really aren't maybe not discussion topics, or I would just like to bring up at some point um, my concerns about. Uh, the House Bill 1303, 21 when CDOT and the county has contracts for any project that uh, uses cement and the processing of that. Okay, so 1303 CDOT contract, is that sufficient for a topic on this list right now? Perfect, yes. Any additions to the agenda? Um, the other one that I have is, um, I would just like to make a statement also, so for future conversations perhaps, 
about our uh, consolidated entry and maybe we need to look at that again and see if it needs to be updated. Consolidated entry? Oh, coordinated. I'm coordinated sorry. Entry. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Any other additions to the agenda? So, okay. Um, oh, I do. <laughs> Thank you. You know, um, and I'm sorry I didn't put this in earlier, but it really didn't come to my, the forefront of my, my mind until I started having conversations with our public safety department and looking at some of, you know, because we're, we're trying to be proactive, diversion, restorative justice, um, those avenues that help bring people to the right, you know, taking the right path. However, because of a lot of state laws, I know this is out of our realm, but if we can kind of work together to, to lobby, to look at, to re-evaluate some of the legislation that has passed that has ne negatively impacted our capacity to keep our community safe. So the topic is legislation that has Legislation on, um, on, I'm sorry? Oh, just, you know, legislation on, uh, I guess, criminal justice. Legislation at the state level. The, at the state level. Okay. Any other suggestions or topics? that we didn't get to prior to this meeting? Okay, I think that's it. Great. And like I said, we're gonna try and move through this. I do want to just a clarification because on number three here on the agenda has public comment. Is there a public comment period that we need to be allocating time for? The public we didn't comment. have public comment last year at the meeting. So I just want to clarify <laughs> and make sure we keep on time. And that has been a, a subject of discussion with our staff and that we were trying to figure out how to do this. Uh, public comment will only come at the end of the meeting if we have time. And that was why we had a, a sign-up list. But it won't be uh, a comment on, it won't be testifying or anything. It's just if they would have a question of one of us. Um, but that would be at the end of the meeting. The first thing we need to do is get through our agenda. I would prefer that if we're going to offer public comment that we allocate time for public comment. Uh, certainly for folks who are here, if you come here and you're ready to speak, then I think we need to honor that. Um, is there any strong objections to allowing folks to, if it's been announced as public comment? I had told a couple of people that called me that it would be at the end. So, um, yeah. Okay, so there's five people okay, appearing on the list, so I think we need to accommodate that. Is yours a two minute or three minute public comment? Three. Three minutes. So it sounds like 15 minutes of public comment. Okay. So can I get a timekeeper assistant? I really appreciate that, Donna. So that we can allow those folks to participate in this meeting. Okay, thank you, Board uh, Do you have the list? I have the a list. Okay. I don't have the list, but we'll, we've got five people on there and we'll work through that there uh, when we get there. Okay, great, yay. Thank you, everybody. Let's get going here on our uh, agenda. So the topic, the initial topic here is one. Uh, Council Member Waters, you already alluded to in regards to child care and early learning in Boulder County. What's here is scale of challenge and ideas for response. So I'd love to have you open it up because that was one of your suggestions and let's have some discussion. Uh, thanks, Martha. <clears throat> so the, what, here, the, here was the wording initially, and there was a reason for it. Uh, child care and early learning in Boulder County and then the semicolon scale of our challenge options for responding and commissioner preferences. And, and if I were to start at the last part of that, I, I'm, a, I'm making an assumption and, and some of it based on conversations you and I have, that the county faces the same challenges that, that the city does in every employer in Boulder County. When it comes to staff having access to accessible, quality, reliable child care. Um, so if I put with that the fact that we have a coalition in Longmont that's been working for a couple of years and you're you know, deeply familiar with this, uh, with the coalition and have been a contributor, this, the, the scope of the potential proposal that that group may come is, would, would extend beyond the city limits of Longmont. This is really a group that's taking a broader look at the scale of the need and what are the options for responding to that scale. In, and I will tell you that we have a retreat coming up. There's a this is a group that's seriously, deeply involved in discussion about what the what the options are. And as you know, one of those may be a proposal to the to the commissioners to put on the ballot a question about creation of a special district. Doing if that happens, 
it's really important for that group to understand whether or not, from a from a commissioner perspective, proposing something that would that would give the county a chance, to, as an entity, as an organization, a chance to be part of the solution, right? So it's something that would maybe map onto this the boundaries of both school districts in the county, which is now what all of Oregon, probably part of five or six more counties, or I mean, that's a heavy lift. Or is that should we just mind our own business and stay focused on the St. Ray Valley District? If we do that, that kind of something that maps onto the St. Ray Valley School District more than more than our city limits, more than Boulder County, parts of Weld and Larimer. But but it would it would not include the county. And, I, and we just don't want to go forward without having a better sense of what you what you kind of you see as options and preferences. That's the reason for the last part of this in terms of an approach. We would think differently about it if we knew that the county and the commissioners wanted to be invited in or dialed into a book and solution. Uh, thank you. Did you want to add? No, no, I would just pass I know you're the mic. Just that. moving the mic to the center. Yeah, absolutely. And folks have uh, additions to that question. Thanks for clarifying the reasoning of what, what that question was uh, initially or the item on the agenda. Two things. The Early Childhood Council, as you know, is part of the county and has been at that table. Danielle Butler has been her team has done a lot of work um, over the years in that conversation. So I, to me, and I was just checking with my county administrator real quick, Janet Peterson, we need to have a conversation with uh, ECC and some other folks who haven't been part of those discussions um, to, and probably wouldn't be initially with the commissioners, but we could certainly have a conversation about who needs to be in that conversation. What would be helpful to me, and, and Commissioner Jones, you're welcome to add in here on the UCC if you're interested on this particular question that uh, Council Member Waters has, because I would say we need to know if it's truly a special district question so we can have the appropriate people in, in that meeting as well. If it's about the ARPA funding, and that grant money that the commissioners did choose to allocate for and ask that came partially from that ECC group. Um, so just to define that so that we can make sure that the right people are in that room to yeah. get you further along. I will tell you the mindset of the group, the, of the coalition, that it's, it's kind of operating as the Longmont Early Childhood Coalition. It, the, the thinking is much broader than Longmont. So this is kind of how where it got started. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, the intent really is to bring a, a proposal uh, that would allow the child care in early childhood education to be funded as a public good. So that's that's beyond, it would be, it's a braided, it, we're, the language that we're using is like a braided funding strategy, take it as a hybrid model, you know, mixed delivery model, take advantage of every dollar available. But to not leave childcare as in, as in the way it exists now as a market segment that has to compete with a whole bunch of other variables, it ends up being way too expensive and way, way less reliable than it needs to be for most of our families. So the only way, from my perspective, for the folks who have been in the discussion, the way to get there is through a special district. That, that is what is top of mind. I don't know that that's where we'll end up, but that, I can tell you that's where the thinking is right now. So. Just to clarify again on that, who needs to be in that room? It, it, what I'm understanding, so, so let me know if I'm wrong, that there's some technical questions as well about what what would a special district require Absolutely. at the county level. Okay. And the legal questions and financial questions. There's, there's a, obviously there's a lot involved. But, but we don't want to waste your time or waste the time of anybody else thinking about something that either the it's too technical or it's too complex or the politics are just too heavy a lift to put something together like that. Okay, I was just gonna see if we could just agree to move that conversation forward because yeah. we have to, more than one commissioner has yep. to agree to allocate some staff time. So what we'll do is we'll take it back to staff and have a conversation and then I will respond to you uh, with staff. You always do, I any other additional comment? The reason I'm hesitant to say yes is the county does a ton of stuff. It's always amazing to me, and you guys know this. Mm -hmm. but, uh, Let me turn this one off. I, and the other thing I learned is 
is that the other thing is that um, we what I also learned is there we've already done a lot of work and so I just want to put it in context of all the other social programs we do because we really try to deli deliver good human service in all sorts of ways and this is one of them I just wanted to be fit and I wanted to be productive if we're going down that road and to, to Marta's point we did help out with the government money to do some of that work uh, and we're trying to do a head start uh, as well. Uh, we just opened another classroom in Boulder, which is their rare thing is in Boulder. So it's great. Did we get through item bullet point number one? Additional? Um, yeah, <coughs> I, I'd like to say, uh, based on what Commissioner Jones said, if, if ARPA money has been put in one place, and then there's Head Start. To me, that seems to uh, highlight the need for unification of the problem and the working group for the solution. The ECC is a collective impact group, um, which should be going partway toward alignment in the sense that you know what collective impact does is that it aligns a number of independent organizations with one another, but. Uh, Someone with with you know jurisdiction or legal understanding of what what something like a special district needs to be doing, um, it, it, it seems like at, there comes a point when formalization of the idea of unity needs to be done because otherwise we lose the the advantage of not having agencies working with duplicative. Uh, programs or at cross purposes so um, you know I, I, I guess that what I'm saying is it's not sufficient to say well we put money here and we put money there we, we, we need to have an, a, a, or an instrument for aligning where the money and how the money is used thank you all right, we'll re move to our next topic. Uh, reducing risk, risks of gun and other forms of violence. Uh, <clears throat> and I think- I put that on the agenda And I think we changed, I might have changed this. Well, and as well. Was reworded. Let me, can I read the, what, because there's a reason for the way it was worded initially. Yes. The, the way it was worded initially was beyond ordinances, reducing risks of gun and other forms of violence. I, what I didn't want to risk was inviting a conversation about ordinances and all that's associated with that. Because for me, that's a starting place, not an ending place. And that we ought to, as I, what has resonated for me multiple times, <clears throat> I wish Claire was, or Commissioner Levy was here. Because as I read comments and, and heard comments about, we need to do everything we can possibly do to reduce risks of gun violence and, and other forms of violence. And I agree with her. And uh, we, we are in a different place right now than other municipalities and, and the commissioners with respect to ordinances. But, but that's not, the, for me, that's not the question. The question is, what should we be doing beyond that? If ordinances are the beginning, what would be the bigger initiative that only happens in Boulder County? Because the commissioners and other elected officials, along with all the other leadership available in our communities, lean in together to say, this is not a legal issue. This is going to be a cultural change. And to influence the culture, we have to have all the cultural influencers, from elected officials to faith leaders to nonprofits to cultural brokers, saying this is important enough for us to do together, right? If there's one county in America where, where it's possible that we could influence the culture to reduce these risks, this is it. Let's take this on as leaders along with our roles or titles as elected officials. That was the that was the that was the question. And whether or not there's an appetite, I think this is a huge issue. Whether or not there's an appetite, I don't even know if we have the appetite, but we've talked about it, right? It's a big ass, it's a heavy lift. I just think it's worth doing and um, dramatically increases the prospects of reducing violence beyond what we're dealing with with words. And that, I'll make one comment and then pass the mic. I don't know if you, in this morning's different post, there was an editorial 
uh, authored by somebody from the Kansas City Star. It was focused specifically on schools and all that's going on hardening schools as targets. But the point of the article was, that's just the beginning. There's so much more that has to be done to change the culture that, that somehow signals it's okay for people to pick up weapons and use them on one another. And that's what I think is the work that's next for us as elected officials in Boulder County. And I'm just wondering where others might stay. Thank you. So thank you for the question. Um, I agree with uh, Councillor Waters. However, I, um, I think that <coughs> leaders need to put out a statement of who we are, what we believe, and where we want our city to go. And to me, that is making a statement if it's ordinances, if it's rules and regulations. Our residents need to know what we think about what's going on. Um, if we don't agree with the rules and laws that are made by our Supreme Court, by our uh, district courts on guns and um, weapons of mass destruction, because that's what I feel some of these are, then we need to speak up and say this, these laws are, are hampering us on the local level to contend with what's going on. Uh, by not saying anything, for me, personally, it feels as though we are, aren't paying attention or that we don't care. So um, I personally think that we do need to make uh, ordinances. The ordinances are good, and I want to thank uh, the other cities in Boulder County and Boulder County for stepping up and saying, this is wrong, folks. Whether you feel you have the right to do that or not, it is wrong to go out and intentionally murder people. So um, I feel very, very strong about that. I know I can just share really briefly in regards to the conversation, which I think is, is kind of what you're asking about, that this is one of the topics that came to the Consortium of Cities over the last couple of years. It was in a response to community members after the March 2021 mass shooting in the city of Boulder. It was a response from local electeds that we all got together and responded. And the statement is one piece, and then I think where you're headed here, uh, Councilor, is what else? And what does that require? And so we began a series of, of meetings with both electeds around the region, from Edgewater to Fort Collins to have this conversation about what else could we do um, and and where we started was with ordinances so i i i would love to hear responses from folks who are interested and, and comfortable but that's that's where we as the county and county commissioners um landed starting in june of addressing continued work that the county has done in regards to education and awareness about the concerns of gun violence in our community and then move forward ordinances um, connected to the work that every town and givers and again local electeds around the region have been discussing for a while um, so the question about what's next i think is for everybody um, all the electeds in the room and I'm happy to give folks another minute to if they'd like to address it Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to say that uh, I still contend that the passing of local ordinances uh, was something that was an error by the General Assembly because uh, almost all of them are either now declared unconstitutional or um, are unenforceable at the local level when we have uh, adjacent jurisdictions that are not going to pass local um, ordinances against various modes of restricting sales um, of firearms. So uh, I actually think that the, that the correct response, regional response for us, which we happen to be the most densely populated region um, in the state, uh, is is to kick it back up to the state legislature and say no this was a false start the little jurisdictions that are acting 
cannot possibly defend against the gun lobby, and therefore the state needs to take on the burden of defense. So that's my position, and I hope that we can consider that regionally. Thank you, and I believe most of the folks that were part of this conversation, the hope is that this is our ability locally to respond to state legislation, speaking of state legislation, that allow local jurisdictions, so Senate Bill 256, to move local regulations forward with the hope of influencing state legislators to move state and then move to national. So I agree with what I think that you're saying. No, I think that's the opposite of what I'm saying, actually. I think I think that, that um, passing local ordinances makes, uh, instead of requiring action at the state level, means that the localities are vulnerable um, to lawsuits without having, you know, they take on the responsibility of defending the lawsuit, but having the ordinance in place makes absolutely no difference whatsoever. So the state needs to, you know, if the, the state, and I believe in local control for most things, right? Pesticides, you know, um, is a real good example of where local control can make a difference. But um, on firearms control, we're talking about people crossing jurisdictions with intention and um, so the, the state gets rid of the legal burden and the political, you know, heavy lift and puts it where um, on, on small jurisdictions that have no ability to respond. So I think that we should push right back hard on the state level jurisdictions and, and use, use our voice as lobbyists with, without trying to um, bring our law enforcement organizations to bear. Thank you, Jennifer. I do have one question. Then we can move on. Um, so in your conversations that you had with community other elected officials, um, were there any police officers, people who are at the first line of defense in those situations, were they present to share, you know, what they see? You know, what um, you know, because that you know, one of the things that you know, I'll talk to, to our um, public safety chief, I'll talk to other police officers, because they're the ones that are right there. You know, they're the ones who know, you know, and who could give us really good insight in passing good policy, um, you know, just meaningful policy. And so, you know, I, I don't want to pass an ordinance just to pass an ordinance. I want it to be meaningful, and I want it to make an impact. Otherwise, you know, there's there's no point in that. But, you know, making sure that the right people, you know, people who are there, you know, the first line of defense when the shooting first happens. The person who is right in front of the shooter, right after they committed these atrocities, are the police officers. Are you know what has been the feedback from um, from sheriff, from police officers who are out on the field? I'm just curious. It, I I have not been part of all of the meetings because there's a smaller cohort of folks working with every town, so I can't tell you yes or no um, enforcement. But I think what. What I'm hearing really in that question is back to the counselor's question about beyond ordinances. I, I, don't, I don't think the question was let's focus on ordinances, but have a background of what we've been doing here locally as a start. And so I don't know if anybody else has other ideas or if it's just an ask to consider that we start, maybe start that conversation, I don't know. But I just want to make sure that we're responding to the question that really was being asked. I think there are a lot of things on the agenda, so I'm going to keep it my cutter dry and have a bad analogy. So, I, Marcia, I believe I agree with the station do more. Having been there and having the scars from doing more, background checks, magazine limits, uh, domestic violence, people who have weapons, uh, it's hard, really hard uh, to. Doing the county ordinance was far easier. I didn't receive any death threats. I didn't have to be escorted to my car like I did when I was in the state senate. So uh, I, I agree they should do it. But the problem is, 
The federal government's not going to help. The state has a lot of difficulty with getting the makeup of the state and how they want people to get it done. And we need to push every level we can. That's kind of where we are. And it's not optimal in any case. I, mean, I felt this way as a state legislator doing state law when it should be federal law. Universal background checks, you kidding me? And, and, and every year they try to overturn him, and there was on the committee that defended it. And we bring up all the people who were murdered or had raped from serious crime who did not have a weapon. That kind of common sense thing makes sense. But it's not happening in the federal government. It happens some at the state government. They've done more. Um, but I also think that we, you know, we got to push it in every level. And that's what I think we're on to. Because I, I was thinking this thing through when we did ours. And the fact is, we got challenged on one of four uh, in court. And we did the uh, assault weapon uh, purchase. Uh, and that's the only one. The others are, in fact, are not challenged. And so this, the case law on this is you can do some things you can't do others. And they're kind of everybody's testing the things that are more aggressive, basically. But uh, I think we're kind of stuck in it. To change the culture, Tim, I wish. Uh, you know, I, I don't understand it. Uh, uh, and what I've learned in being in the legislature and the local government, do things that you can get done because they're going to be darn hard to do. And, uh, and that's what I'm saying. So you got to push it. But if somebody has a great way of changing people's minds about weapons, um, I think great, no power to you. Can, can I just make one more comment? I, I, great question, Matt, about changing minds. And I think you got to change hearts first before minds change. And and I, I admire the, I admire the courage that the, the, the commissioners brought to this issue and that other municipalities have, have brought. Um, I'm not certain what the net will be in terms of effects. My here's one of my worst fears is that a lot of money is going to get spent defending lawsuits that ultimately people are going to lose, who the decision lose. And I think about how those dollars can be used differently. And um, the one, I, the what I keep, and this probably people will go, are you nuts? I mean, this is this has no relevance. But I, the the the, the model for me, kind of the image of this. Is, is what happened in South Africa with the truth and reconciliation process. Coming out of decades of violence and oppression and the worst atrocities we can imagine, those leaders conceived of a process to bring a society together and hold it together. And they did, there were hearts that changed and minds that followed. There was accountability. When there was, when people needed to be held accountable, they were. It was also forgiveness, and it's a, so it, it's and it's probably not an equivalent, but it's an example of a society that took this on and pulled it off. Not perfect, not seamless, but it does require the willingness of leaders to lean in hard and, and accept the challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Which is residential development, which also was edited, and I feel like it's probably comes to the water. So go ahead. Yep. <laughs> it was. was my, it was edited. Yeah. The, the this really is a question. It would help me to learn more about how the commissioners view res, any kind of development, but residential in particular, outside of the municipality, because as we think about. When to or not to annex, right? To bring something from the county into the city, and all of the issues with respect to infrastructure and spawn and all the things that we can become concerned about. Um, I know you have similar kind of concerns. I just it would help me to know um, as we continue to acquire open space, which means which we all love the open space program, but less land available. And if, and if if development is allowed or not in the county, that would be helpful to know as we think about other housing proposals that come along. So it really is a question. I'd like to be educated more about how you all think about development of, of any type, you know, outside of the municipality and the county. So uh, this this is a very old issue in this county. 
uh, back to the Jimsy Heath days, uh, and the thought of the commissioners at the time was development should happen over their city services. And the county is limited in what I can do. Compared to our own city, we don't have a ton of authority. We only do what we are allowed to do at the same legislature. <coughs> Excuse me. So the only development reviews we have is somebody has a legal building block. We did one today, specific house. We don't do subdivisions like Douglas County, for instance. Uh, and the idea is to not have sprawl, and I think it's working. And I also think and, and, and we're always educating people who have an interest in us providing services when they're outside of the city. And talking about this issue, you know, we have limited powers, we are not a city, we are a county. We're not designed to provide water. Uh, and it's it's kind of a struggle, but that's that's the focus. So we want you to do city services, and we want to do county services, and we are not going to have a bunch of development outside of the cities. And in fact, the compliance specifically says we will push development to cities. So that's that's the philosophy. And I, I appreciate them doing. They were part of. I mean, you can drive across county lines and see the difference. Uh, a couple of them were hung in effigy, and I was, by the way, my dad's on it. That's how contentious it was about Stuart and so on. Here's my history lesson. Yes. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions on that topic of development? Let's move to the next item here. Uh, status of current and future efforts for unhoused residents. That was your <laughs> Thank you for your participation and planning for this meeting. Seriously, I appreciate it. Well, you know, I'll be home if I, if I, if I done this, so I apologize, I guess. No. Um, th this is not unrelated to the previous item. As we, as if we're gonna, if, if indeed, and I understand that, the, the thinking, um, I just, it, would, it, would, it, it was helpful to get a clarification, both the history and, and, the, and you know, the challenges, the constraints that the county faces. Um, but it does raise the question then, if, if we're gonna house the house, if we're gonna house the unhoused, it's gonna be in the municipalities. And I know there was a regional, before I got, right before I came on this council, there was a regional conference and a regional strategy with some targets set. And it may be that there's, through the Consortium of City or other ways, lots of progress that's been made or iterations of that going forward. And I'm just out of the loop. But it would be helpful to me to know from a county commissioner perspective, kind of what's your vision for where we ought to be going in terms of housing the unhoused, understanding it's going to happen, it's going to, be, have to, it's going to require cooperation, shared resources, and it's going to require um, municipalities to take this on. So, so thanks. I a couple different pieces on the just on the housing topic in general. One of those is it's still in county, unincorporated Boulder County, is accessory dwelling unit. And I know the City of Longmont has a phenomenal EDU program um, that I use as an example when I'm talking to other regions. Uh, we have. We do allow ADUs under very specific uh, guidelines in an incorporated Boulder County that might be an agricultural tenant where an applicant has to prove that they really do need a full-time ag worker to approve that um, additional residential unit. There is a family care unit for the reasons that we know that housing needs change for families. It's a multi-generational household and that applicant has to explain the real need of why somebody has to be on site for health reasons, et cetera. Um, we just looked at, under the Article 19 and response to Marshall Fire, a disaster care unit, and because the commissioners approved an ADU in that, under that scenario in phase one of a review, and the phase two of that review will be looking at ADUs um, in a similar way similar way county-wide for the corporate Boulder County. So I just want to make sure folks know that because that was new news for me when I started. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know um, what those opportunities were 
The other piece is, as you all know, and I saw some of you as this spoke on Hoffman uh, last week, the continued push from county commissioners as well as Boulder County Housing Authority because we're also that board in regards to affordable housing the opportunities throughout the county. The consideration of what areas in our county uh, are part of the regional housing partnership, which I think is what you're, you're referring to, that came from the Consortium of Cities, that initial conversation and then that summit, folks put those, that work together. And through the ARPA funds, we just allocated another $1.5 million, I believe it was, at least $1 million to really think, to get, uh, reinvigorate that work because we know that we need to be doing that. The other piece that's a continued conversation is outside of uh, affordable housing and rental units of how do we respond to home ownership. Um, so to some of the questions or comments and introductions from both uh, Councilman Yarber and Councilmember Hidalgo uh, Perry, what does that look like at the county level? And that was another decision we made in the ARPA funding specific to Longmont in, in this community was to fund home ownership in, with Habitat for Humanity in $800,000 of infrastructure that will allow them to fill those units here at Longmont uh, shortly. So we're looking at those projects, we're looking at uh, a TOB study of Superior that could be a really phenomenal transit-oriented workforce housing along the corridor, um, affordable housing, and we also know that these projects take a lot of time. So just to kind of give you a breath, and there's many more, the cost of this, but also we were talking about how do we um, get that more refinanced. You all probably know that there's a 40% vacancy rate on that particular complex here in Longmont. That's a loss of units that are literally sitting vacant right now. And so how do we work with USDA and those guidelines that are so strict to really help and support families? So these are just a quick, a quick summary of some of the projects in regards to housing because every place that is, every unit that we can get people into opens up a unit for somebody else in a different scenario, whether it's our senior housing, whether it's transitional housing, et cetera. So I also want to, uh, Weigh in on this. This actually morphs into one of the things I wanted to add to the agenda, which is um, the Boulder County Coordinated Entry System, which is phenomenal. Um, their vision is housing first, um, but we are in kind of a different, uh, a different sea change here with um, with the pandemic, with the inflation, with everything that we're seeing more and more unhoused people. Um, the problem with housing first as the only way to get housing is that we, we could use transitional housing here while we build housing for the unhoused. We can't seem to build it fast enough. So if we could look at the coordinated entry system and maybe expand their view of that, to have transitional housing in order to um, in order to house some people for a while so they can at least work, have a place to put their stuff while we are building housing for them. Um, the other the reason that I am interested in this is that it kind of also goes into the justice system in that in order to be able to work with our unhoused people, um, who are not exactly good players in the community. We need to have so many beds in order to put, according to, I think it is the Ninth Judicial, Judicial District as well as the Supreme Court, that you, you must have a place for people to go in order to have regulations for them to leave your city. Um, for example, to put up uh, regulations around your parks, uh, your public public areas that they cannot be in. Um, so we're kind of caught in the middle right there, uh, and that is uh, in the interest that I have um, so that we can actually get more control over our city with the unhoused, both the bad players, which we seem to have quite a few of that probably would go down to the last bullet point here of opioid uh, concerns um, in order to get to divide the groups of people, the ones that want to be housed, but we don't have the housing if we put them in transitional. Um, so 
that is something that I, I would like uh, the county to think about and to have that discussion. Is this, is this a way that we should go now in this different um, paradigm that we're seeing? I'm wondering if you could just, uh, so one of the, the other projects, uh, projects is the right word, but one of my other uh, duties is working with the Metro Area County Commissioners, and they have been over the last six months or so hearing from communities around different counties in regards to concerns about unhoused communities. And one of the Suggest so just to clarify what you mean by transit um, transitional housing would be helpful because the other term that I've heard in some of those presentations, which are um, is recovery housing. So I just want to understand which housing you're talking about when you when you're asking for transitional housing versus housing first. What is the term you just used, Marta? Recovery recovery housing. Um, I don't really see much of a difference. What, what I am thinking of, and this is, again, just off the top of my head and what I've been trying to work on, is having transitional housing where wraparound services not necessarily um, located. What, what we're seeing in our community is that we have a lot of services, but people who do not have a, a place to go have to wander all over the city to get those. And if you're unhoused, if you're having issues, chances are of, of wanting to go to Recovery Cafe, to go to uh, the Hour Center, to find different services isn't working. My vision, I guess, of transitional housing would be that the services would go to them rather than having our unhoused people try to figure out through the city. We have a great brochure that tells where they can get different services. But to find them when you are carrying your clothes around, when you're, it doesn't really address the problem on the scope that we're seeing it. So um, the transitional housing, in my view, and this would be a discussion, of course, um, would be that those would, would schedule times of the day that they would go, those services would go to wherever that transitional housing is. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So uh, my point of view on this is uh, I support the work staff's doing with Humble Solutions for Boulder County, which is a housing first approach. The problem is it's a difficult problem. We all know that. Mm -hmm. The other problem is we don't have a long ton of money. So I'm really supportive of staff using evidence-based approach to do the most good. And that's where the coordinated entry and all that comes in. Because people who are unhoused often have other challenges they have to address and need help with. And so that, that's the focus of this group. And so I would ask that staff have that conversation about your idea and how that kind of fits and how, what can, can be done. Uh, we are such a difficult thing. I've been really impressed with how many people are our house. The numbers sound low, but it's because it's such a hard, hard problem. So anyway, that's that's my two cents. So Matt, I agree with you on one, on uh, just on one part of that. The reason that I am thinking the other way is because we started the safe lots where uh, some of our residents were living in their cars. The problem was they had no place. Once they were living, drove to work, came home, they had no place to shower to eat, et cetera. So the churches, a couple of churches opened their doors, allowing them to use their uh, bathroom facilities and then home, provided the meals in the evening. They, out of that, uh, I hope I am stating this correctly, but 59 people have been housed out of that in permanent housing because they had a place to be out of the weather, a place to get services, while they waited for the housing to become available. We also have people living on the streets who, who would like to be in housing and have said they want to be, but they have no place to go while they are doing that. I know the Boulder Shelter uh, is there, but the hours don't always work for people when they are 
working and they get off at five and they have to be at the shelter by five. So, um, and they have to be out of there by 7.30 or whatever. So that is what we've been, what I have been looking at for the past seven years is how do we, how do we make that gap work so that people who really want to be housed have a place to go. We know who they are. We're working with them. But do we just say, hang in there, you can sleep, you know, good luck sleeping on the river until we can get enough housing for you. And that's, in our community, that's what I want to house and, and bridge that gap. Again, I think the staff should have a conversation about that, that, that challenge. And there's a lot of here. That's, I, I trust our staff who are professionals in education and all that background in this more than I trust myself. And that's true of a lot of county business. Mm -hmm. As a commissioner, you kind of see your three CEOs. It's kind of the way it works. And so staff does all the work. You, you have to provide direction. And if there's a problem, then you step in. But still, we have great staff, and I trust them. And I say that because I used to be a great staff member at the city of <laughs> But truly, that is the lesson I had for that job, one of the lessons, is that people around me knew what to do, and when the elected leaders got involved, sometimes it didn't go very well. And so I'm going to trust the staff on it. Great. Now we know, they know what we wanted to work on. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. All right, let's move to our next item here on uh, current and future regional transportation projects. So I have been working on, as some of you know, to get that goofy Northwest Corridor rail project to Longmont. Our, uh, our hope, our best hope at this point is that uh, Pete Buttigieg gives Amtrak a load of money because they are very interested in using our Northwest Corridor to get to Denver. To that uh, means I got on the board of the Front Range Passenger Rail District um, and we meet every month. Hopefully our very first block of funding will come in late December and then another one in March. So um, constantly pushing that and working hard on it. Um, we are to that effect, December 3rd, going to have a transportation meeting in Longmont um, with uh, Andy Carcian, who is the director of Front Range Passenger Rail, and I will speak to the community, let you know where we are, what we are doing with it. Um, We've invited Deborah Johnson, who is the director of RTD, as well as Eric Davidson, who is our um, RTD director. I'm sorry, um, Deborah Johnson is the CEO and executive director of RTD. Um, Eric Davidson is just our district representative. So we should also have the uh, study done by BNSF hopefully around late April or May of next year, and that'll give us some direction as well. Um, to the Northwest Mayors and Commissioners Coalition, every month we talk about the transit and there is a coalition that is really pushing to move this forward. Uh, if we don't get that money and they do not pick our alignment, then I think we need to have a, a different discussion about we have to stop trying to do this and, and think of a different way. Um, locally, um, Councillor Martin and I are both on a connectivity group that is looking at re-examining, putting out an RFPs for transit companies to provide local transportation within our city that would augment what RTD is doing now with our free uh, with our free bus service. However, many of the cities, and I do think the county has had these conversations as well, about maybe RTD needs to get out of the local transportation and concentrate on regional. So um, 
those conversations I think are real and we need to have them and move forward in what we can do for our cities. Any, absolutely, any comments or suggestions are very, very welcome in how we move this forward. So uh, I'll jump in. Um, I agree with you, Joan. We, we need to deliver on Northwest Road. I'll tell you a quick story. I used to do a lot of town halls when I was a state legislator. I do some town halls now as a county commission too, but I did them in East County. And so I was in Longmont, Roseville, Lafayette. And sometimes you choose issues and sometimes issues choose you. And I can't tell you, almost every town hall in the district, regardless of where it was in East County, said, when are we getting our train? Right. Over and over. And that's what people want. And as Casey Becker told me when she was speaking to us, why don't we give people what they want? And I think we need to pursue the federal funding. I think that's the most likely path. However, if that doesn't happen, I think the answer is giving up on the rail. It's saying, look, do we need this bus or do we do the rail? And the thing is, the bus is cheaper to do incrementally, but when you stand it up, it's a lot more money. It's kind of like getting your kid to save for something big and they spend it here and spend it here and they don't ever get enough money for the big thing. That's the conversation I think we should have. We're duplicating services in corridors. And in fact, and we should be thinking about putting money in there. And I know it's RTD money and all that and the complications around it. And RTD needs to perform. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't give them an inch, in my opinion, on this. It's something they have failed us on and done almost every. Every other corridor, I say every other, because a couple of them are complete. But the trade-off, if, if there's limited money, let's get the rail. Don't keep talking about bus rapid transit, which isn't really bus rapid transit. It's faster buses. It's not a dedicated lane like bus rapid transit is supposed to be. And prioritize what people want. And it's true. I heard this in Boulder too. I was at a town hall from some of the Boulder legislators, and. Um, <coughs> When they had a beer with a friend, five or six people stood around, same sentiment, very strong. And so that's what we should be doing, in my opinion. Give people what they want. Uh, when it comes to intra-city transportation, uh, I absolutely agree with that. When people want the train, we should hold RTD accountable for that. Enabling RTD to do what they have at times succeeded in doing, which is providing intercity transit um, by taking the noise off their plates and in particular negotiating something that improves their business model by removing their failure points. I don't see how that is at all um, uh, in opposition to what Commissioner Jones just said. Um, the models for intra-city transit, which is an aspect of multimodal transit, um, is, you know, it's different than intra-city intra inter transportation. I say intra-city so much that I can't say inter-city anymore. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the, our, our internal inside Longmont multimodal plan is different and we get just as many irate and urgent requests for us to complete our bike and, and pedestrian network, to have ride sharing services be more ubiquitous, to somehow provide a way around the city that can minimize personal automobile ownership or personal automobile use um, without writing an RTD intra-city line that is optimized for the fewest number of drivers and the fewest number of vehicles, because that's the wrong objective function for intra-city transit, right? You don't want one long trip around the city, and if you're at the wrong end of the, of the line, you've got to ride for 30 or 45 minutes to get from someplace that you could get to in 10 minutes by car if you had one. And that means that ridership is always going to be limited to people who don't have a car and can't walk that 10 minute drive. Um, 
And, and it's never going to be a choice that people will take instead of driving a car. So I really, my, the whole point of this long story is that they are two separate problems. I absolutely agree that we need to hold RTD to account in terms of true rapid transit. I also think there's nothing wrong with negotiating um, uh, with RTD uh, to get them to agree to taking local transit off their plates so they can be better at giving us our damn train. So I, th I think they're, they're two different two different things. I just want to add one more thing. You know, the state and Dr. Cog have greenhouse gas reduction uh, levels. We are building more roads for more cars. Uh, we are widening roads. We are putting on extra lanes for bus rapid transit. Even if everybody had an electric car, the congestion would still be horrible. Uh, we would still need more lanes and more cars. Amtrak has in their model uh, electric train, electric engines. Um, so it makes more sense to me to not put as much effort into widening I-25, but getting that train, putting all of our um, all of our dollars, all of our energy into helping getting that front range passenger train down I-25 and not spending a lot of money on more cement, more cars, more, get them out of there, get, it, get them out of the cars and, and make high speed rail. Um, so that is the other reason I really want to push this is that if we are really truly interested in getting rid of greenhouse gases, then we need to have uh, fast transit that can help us get to our goals faster and cleaner. A train will do that. I just want to add in a couple pieces just for context as well of what else is the county doing in regards to this conversation about transportation. Yes, on Northwest Hill. Uh, yes, on educating folks how to use what we have. Yes, on addressing the final mile. Um, it, there's a lot of different pieces that we can do, but I do want to make sure that folks know that the Highway 66 from May down over that widening section is partially funded by the county tax. Um, and those, speaking of ballot measures, we have a, a transporta transportation tax extension that is coming up on your November ballot and without that extension of the current tax so there's no change to that that number um, without that we can't move forward on our multimodal transportation we can't open up some new uh, gateways in regards to accessibility mobility for all um, goals here in the county and it would really pull us back to very basic maintenance of infrastructure and just to get folks um, I don't think it's a surprise to our electeds from City of Longmont because you all are such great partners in regards to flood recovery. But we are still working over at Sugarloaf on a road construction project that was uh, in response to the 2013 flood that we experienced in Boulder County. So just for context, a couple of the other pieces, um, the Right Free Longmont, if somebody mentioned that, is, was also in cooperation and partnership with the Boulder County and and City of Longmont. The uh, East County Line Road from Slayton over to St. Grand Creek, uh, that's also a split of cost, and that's a construction project that's in the planning uh, for 2023 uh, as far as just other partnerships that we're working on. And then, of course, the bus rapid transit, the Colorado 119 multimodal transportation project, the commuter bike way. Uh, so there's a lot of different pieces when we talk about transportation, so I just want to make sure folks know um, that Fuller County staff, transportation, our department, is doing a lot of work in partnership with city and their staff as well when we talk about the regional work that the staff have been here. And, and also for City of Longmont that benefits residents here specifically. Marty, you're correct, and I want to thank the county very much for all the input you're putting into our transportation. Uh, within the city as well as in, within the county because uh, without your help, we couldn't do it. And none of us could. We need to work together. So thank you very much. 
And Matt, I did make a motion to include the transportation uh, one C in in our um, response and, and support of the county measures because I know I was remiss in doing that a couple of weeks ago. Oh, one C is the transportation. Oh, yes. yes, yes. So one A and one B were voted on. One C will be okay. Thank you for that. I was speaking over here at the same time. Um, and thank you. We'll share that. Thank you to our staff because we all know that. It's, it's our staff who does a lot of heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have three more items on here. One was just in regards to opioid, and I'm thinking it might have been specific to the regional council, um, but the, the topic on here is opioid concerns. Okay, and my understanding is that there was an ask maybe from the mayor to Commissioner Levy about what was going on with the opioid council. Oh, I, I, yeah, yeah, I did. I, 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 and <laughs> you asked, and so that's why that's how it got added uh, right. based on the request. And my understanding also is that our city manager, our city manager, as, as a resident of Guatemala, uh, city manager Harold Dominguez also participates on that. And because Commissioner Levy isn't here, um, I don't know if you want to just touch on it so that folks are aware of the work in that first meeting that has happened. Yeah, so um, I did get, can you hear me? Yeah. So the city council did vote on an intergovernmental agreement where we moved our funds over there um, as part of that agreement. I believe I got put on the uh, ROC group, which is the policy oversight uh, for the opioid conversation. Uh, we had our first meeting last week, last Thursday or Friday, I believe. And uh, basically it was, a um, large part of it was what I would say is an organizational meeting in terms of setting up how we were going to operate as a group. Uh, they did present uh, associated with that in the IGA. There is a technical advisory group um, of which we do have, the city of Long Rock has a member on that group and that technical group has been working on looking at projects in the first year of the opioid settlement that is what we would consider to be shovel ready and ready to go now and spend those funds. Um, they gave us a list of those projects and so we're in the process now as board members of going through that list and evaluating them. And then I think we'll have a more robust conversation at the next meeting, which is scheduled in a couple of weeks, I believe. So we've got our first and we're all getting our sea legs under us in terms of understanding what that looks like. Thank you. Just as a question for folks who might be listening, is there an opportunity for public comment in regards to that list that you're talking about or how would community members who weren't elected to be on a non-voting seat of those regional councils participate? Um, in terms of community members, I know they did, um, I'm trying to remember the agenda. I know the meeting was open to the public, but there wasn't a necessarily, I think, a public comment period in that one. I'm not sure what the agenda is structured in terms of the future um, items, um, but I know that um, I, I have to go through all the list of the projects. And, and we talked a little bit about um, the concept of funding a shovel ready project now. This is something that I brought up in the conversation and really looking at the need for treatment dollars. And, you know, so one of the things that I'm going to be particularly interested in in terms of those projects is what, what really encumbers funds ongoing into the future and how does that impact um, the possibility of treatment uh, programs and is there going to be money in the future because if we allocate a lot of dollars today uh, for projects that are shovel ready today does that limit what we need to see and this is from our public safety department is really more focused on treatment in the future because that's really driving a lot of our issues and are we limiting funding available to us in the future? And so that was a question I brought up in that meeting. Um, and I think that's what I'm gonna be looking at it. And, and so for our council, uh, once I can get through this, I'll be able to give you a more detailed explanation. Hey, thank you for filling in with an update. I wanna, we've got one of the additional options, or 
uh, topics on there, but we need to get to public comment um, because there were five people that were on that list, and I'm gonna let somebody else uh, facilitate that how you normally would facilitate because our ending time this evening is 7 30. Don, are you going to use the timer or? I'm, I'm happy to time if you'd like me to be your timer. Okay. So uh, to the public, we'll continue to, just like we do, I suppose, at the meetings, uh, you have three minutes and your name and address. And the first one on the list is Eileen McCarran. Do you want to just read through the list so folks know who's going to be coming up next? <laughs> sure. So uh, Robert Colts will be after Eileen, and Steve Altshuler, and Newman, and then um, Stan Gell. Is it off? No, it's a little closer to you. So, good evening. I'm Eileen McCarran, and I speak for Colorado Ceasefire, a statewide group um, dedicated to reducing gun violence. And I live in Denver, but I was, I'm, I'm here at the request of a Longmont um, resident. We have been active since 2000, and we worked to uh, repeal the preemption law, which I will let you know that the preemption law was enacted in 2003. So before that time, cities and counties could pass their own uh, gun laws. Uh, Longmont does not suffer the level of gun violence that the larger cities of the state do. Denver, Colorado Springs, and Aurora actually comprise three-fifths of the gun homicides that have occurred already this year, 187. Nevertheless, you are not a stranger to this epidemic. Just this August, a 13-year-old boy was shot and killed in another injured near a basketball court in a drive-by shooting. And last year, a postal worker was shot and killed in a domestic violence incident. There is no question that stronger gun laws mean fewer gun deaths and injuries. The correlation is very strong. States like Hawaii, Massachusetts, and Connecticut have strong gun laws and low gun death rates. Similarly, states with large cities like California and New Jersey experience low gun death rates because of their strong gun laws. For example, California's gun death rate is one third of that of the sparsely populated Wyoming, where gun laws are the second weakest in the country. I'm gonna talk about proposals that don't necessarily run into the Bruin issue. Um, they, these are ones that haven't been subjected to lawsuits across the country so far. So one of these would be uh, the waiting periods proposal which would strongly be impacted by uh, impact suicide. Suicide attempts by firearms are fatal 85% of the time. Another is prohibiting firearms in sensitive places. Certainly this is an obvious public safety issue where children are frequent visitors. Daycare, museums, hospitals, libraries, and parks, just to name a few. But it'd also be valuable in places where large crowds gather like in stadia and where alcohol is served. The relationship between gun violence and alcohol and drug abuse is incredibly strong. The repeated incidents of shooting, sometimes fatal, in Denver's Lodo is quite illustrated. Another is requiring gun stores to post particular signage reminding people of the danger of bringing guns into their home. One valuable measure is gun dealer regulations. Colorado has no licensing program. You could be a test case here. Robert Holt. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the opportunity to speak here tonight. And uh, actually, I was uh, I put down possibly I would speak to this issue of the uh, child um, 
child care and early learning, but I was more specifically interested in like the topics of education, not so much on the, the budget and the funding issues. So really, I don't have any comment on, uh, on that. But thank you. Thank you, Robert. Steve Altshuler. My name is Steve Altshuler. Um, just want to start with a little saying, a paraphrase. God grant me the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to accept the things that I cannot. As you can tell from my shirt, I am a strict believer in the Constitution. The Constitution is what makes the United States what it is. We may not always agree with it, but it's our founding guideline. I want to point out that guns are a legal issue in our Constitution. I think, Dr. Waters, you said they shouldn't be, but they are a legal issue. We can't help that. 75% of mass shooters obtain their guns illegally. There are already enough laws, we just need to enforce them and not take away the rights of honest citizens. Mass shootings stopped by police average 11 deaths per attack. Mass shootings stopped by a good guy with a gun average two deaths per attack. The Supreme Court has ruled recently that states cannot have a may carry rule. Everyone has a right to carry. This I disagree with. Sadly, they even ruled that released felons have the right to carry because the Constitution doesn't say that they cannot carry. Local cities are being fiscally irresponsible if they try to enact laws that are contrary to Supreme Court rulings. It's going to take up lots of court time and legal time, and the issue's already been decided. Also, 76% of mass shootings are in cities in the cities are in gun-free zones. You can look this up. The shooters are not stupid. They don't want to be shot back at. That's why they go to schools, they go to churches, they go to supermarkets, they go where they think there will be no guns. Let willing teachers be trained and armed and have schools have one door for access. The key there is willing teachers. Now, I wouldn't give a gun to everyone or anyone, just people that are ready, willing, and able to be trained. Support our police, support our Constitution, as you all swore to do when you took office. And as far as the opioids are concerned, cancel your city's sanctuary cities and quit inviting illegals and drugs into our cities. When a criminal or a drug dealer is arrested, prosecute them, quit letting people off. That's why Denver is number one in the country for gun crime, because the, I guess it's prosecuting attorney for Polis, they said that after the third or fourth car theft, you should consider arresting these people. Arrest them after one, there won't be two, three, and four. And Chicago has the most strict gun laws in the nation, and they're number one in deaths and murders. And we all know that from any news broadcast. Thank you. And, and it is. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ann Noonan. I live on Sumner Street in Longmont. Uh, thank you for the opportunity tonight for this dialogue. It's been great. And uh, Mayor Peck, I thank you for your comments about uh, the need to make a stand and that it's important for us to use our voices to express um, our feelings about gun safety and uh, violence reduction and that we can nitpick all we like, but we have to do what we can, where we can, when we can. And so I think that's really important. I have a couple of notes here. Um, so yeah, the initiatives do matter, and I think we're seeing a tide turning in our country about uh, our interpretations of safe laws and uh, creating, not, not undoing the Second Amendment, but reducing harm. Uh, mass shootings are horrible, but what we really are looking at in Colorado is the number of suicides and domestic violence deaths by guns. And there are many things that we can do to help reduce those. Um, lastly, I would just want to say, well, two of the state initiatives I think have been really helpful and we need to just continue to work on them. Safe storage is making a big difference and our city can continue to support safe storage, appreciate uh, the chief and public safety here has helped us with a couple of safe storage giveaways, um, and we will continue to be doing that. We have another one scheduled for uh, Veterans Day. 
and also the ERPA laws. As people figure out how to use ERPA laws more effectively, right now it's mostly law enforcement, but friends and family as a city, it's one of those things we can do as a community to help educate. Don't need new initiatives on this, we just need to help people understand what the laws are and how they can use them. And then finally, I just want to say, I think the most important thing we can do right now is find the middle ground. I think we can all agree we don't want a three-year-old to pick up a gun and kill themselves. We don't want that to happen. That's family fire, where it happens within a friendly situation. Nobody wants that child to have died. Suicide, a 14-year-old that comes home and finds an unsecured weapon. Those are the kinds of things that we can start really chipping away at and make a difference and change the culture over time about the use of guns and the proliferation of guns. So, thank you. Thank you, Ann. Stan, thank you. Good evening. I'm Stan Gill from Longmont, and you'll all like how brief I'll be. I have four questions for our Longmont City Council on gun violence prevention. One, is there anything more important for elected officials to do than to maximize public safety? Other, most of the other municipalities in our county have already taken the lead on gun violence prevention. Longmont must also step up. Two, are the leaders of, as the leaders of Longmont, wouldn't you want to leave a legacy of doing everything possible to prevent gun violence and safeguard our children and all of our city residents? Three, will the city of Longmont bury its head in the sand while Longmont parents bury their children? Four, what will it take? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Stan. So, uh, Marta, I'll turn this back over to you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the public that wants to uh, make a, a statement? Say no. Did you close your public comment? I am. Okay. Seeing that, I will close public comment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're going to be done here in five minutes. Thank you. Thank you to the public who's here. And uh, I always find it very helpful, uh, whether it's a land use hearing, it's a business meeting, et cetera. I just hear what people are thinking. And, and certainly what's happening specific to Longmont is important to us. I just want to say thank you for hosting us. Thank you for the meal. Thank you for the dialogue. Uh, and I appreciate the continued conversation as we are serving. We are all public servants. Elected officials, we are on call all the time. We signed up for that. We ran for office. That's why we're here at these tables together. I want to thank our staff because our staff did not run for office and they did not want to be here at 7.30 uh, <laughs> in the evening. And they do it because they are also public servants. And so I always uh, want to make sure that we recognize everybody who is um, here and helps us come together. So I'm not going to speak anymore. I just want to say thank you to everybody. Um, yeah, just one thing. I want to recognize you, I think. Yes. Um, so Eileen, it was as obvious as the house. I've worked with Anne Marie Jensen, who people around here know, uh, doing that work. And you were in this fight early on. And I was on the committee of reference often for these bills. And you were a trooper, and your perseverance is incredible. We're learning from you for Northwest Rail, so we can make that happen. But thank you for doing all your work you've done. It was so it was funny when I saw you when I came in this month. Yeah. Uh, uh, am I back in committee? Oh my god. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for indulging me. I want to thank our staff as well. Um, I know that you don't want to be here this late at night. <laughs> but thank you very much for all your work and thanks to the public for showing up. And I think we are probably does anybody else on the council want to make a statement? No? City attorney, do you? <laughs> City manager, do you? <laughs> we can be done earlier than we have time. I know we are. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.